Okay, okay, okay. Give thanks, give thanks. Give thanks, give thanks. New heights, new beginnings. New heights, new beginnings. New heights, new beginnings. So we're going to take today um, from the video that we did uh, a few days ago speaking about the Kushite, the Ethiopian. Um, let me go right here. We actually had ended the topic um, speaking about Quetesh um, and the fact that Quetesh embodies several teaching several locations several groups and actually a unity under Quetesh so let's look at several things of Quetesh then we'll go back and we'll come back in and we'll get back to her again uh, Quetesh embodies the Baal Balat Gebel Lady of Bibelos um, Quetesh is put with Ashtar or Ishtar um, so if any of you have been studying the history on Ishtar, Quetesh is put with El as a wife, as the consort. So let's go up here. She's also a consort of El. Um, she's also classified as holy and blessed. <clears throat> she's the blessing. She's the holy one, the Holy Spirit. You know, we say the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. When some people say, well, they took the mother out. They took the feminine principle out. Well, that's actually what Kodesh actually represents is that feminine principle. She is also known as the lady of the stars of the heavens, beloved of, a, beloved of Ta, the eye of Ra, the great of magic, mistress, mistress of the stars, mistress of all the gods. Um, she is wearing the Hathor, the Hathor wig. If you know the significance in Hathor, Hathor means Het Heru, house of Heru, house of the hero. She represents the god men. And here you see also the Canaanite warrior Reshep. So there's a lot with Quedesh. She is also represented as Asherah. If you study the history on Asherah, Asherah was also the wife of Yahweh. So, as you see here, it explains that the Asherah in the cult of Yahweh in Israel, Kodesh Astar Anat. Um, so, there's a lot of Canaanite history. And why are we talking about Canaanite history? Let's, let's just do a little read back um, before we go there. Let me just see if we can kind of get a little understanding um, so that we uh, kind of got a, a mindset of who is Canaan and how is it connected with what we call the Cushite. So we're talking about this Cushite lineage and this Cushite lineage, uh, da, 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 Moses wife was a Cushite, so on forth, but, uh, not trying to get there. How I, okay. Well, they didn't go too direct in the bloodline here on this one. Um, there was Sam, uh, Ham, Godson, Noah, the brother Miserim put, and then you get to Canaan. Um, Cush was the father of Nimrod. So what makes that important is Nimrod goes a certain place. We can go a little further. I go a little further. Uh, Nimrod is the mighty hunter before the Lord. Nimrod goes to the land called Shinar or Mesopotamia, later on called Akkadian or Akkad. Um, that's the same place where later on you hear about Abraham and so forth, Lot and them um, leaving the land of their forefathers. So there's a lot of history there. But let me let me get to this uh, beginning and let's start back here so we can kind of line this up. Why are we going through this? Why are we talking about this? What does what is the relevancy of this? Well, we're talking about birthrights and understanding a lot of the things that um, we in text about religion um, or how we perceive religion. So let me say this. The biggest hoax ever taught to the world 
was separation of church and state. If you live in America and you still believe that there's a separation of church and state and that you are in a democratic society, you are the most delusive person in the world then. We do not live in a place that is separated from church and state. The papal bull doctrine is what gives life to what we call America and American government. That means all of those governments that are created from the time period of the doctrine of discovery are governments created by a churchical order. Churchical order. And all of these governments have pursued it with this churchical order as it is the empowerment and the authority of the planet. And because we've allowed and perceived that it is the power and authority of the planet, the planet has been going in chaos. So why are we talking about? Let's talk about where was the true power and authority that kept the planet in divine righteousness, brought civilization and taught the teachings of divine acceptance and spiritual truth amongst all people. Where did we get these concepts and things from? So this is why we're talking about this. And this is where our history comes, because when we say we, the the black people of the world, um, the Ethiopian, the Kushite, this is understanding that we of Africa um, were always great travelers of the world and educators and builders of civilization. <laughs> So we started the topic the other day. We're going to go back through it pretty fast again. And you're always going to see me key back to Melchizedek. I'm going to keep keying to Melchizedek. Um, one of the things is um, to bring the educative knowledge and to find the, the go-between so that our people can find um, their unification, even in the spiritual concepts. Um, I heard a sister say, you know, if we try to say somebody is returned Jesus, we got to be crazy because Platonius and them created the concept of Jesus out of Serapis. So why are we following these concepts? Well, the concept of a hero, a Messiah coming, wasn't just formulated with the Platonius and the Serapis, but that is the formalization of it. That is truth. And some people like to say Serapis is Osiris and Apis put together. Um, but the Serapis is just what it is. It's the Seraphim. It's the Caduceus. It's the flying serpent. It's a symbol of a certain people. It's the symbol of a science of a people. So some people have said that this serpent, this this Kundalini or this Caduceus symbol, this serpent symbol represents people who carry the the Naga or the third eye or the, the measurements of that divine heights that man once carried on the planet that was falling from the planet that we were losing. So. Let me say that they, they, they also called them the children of the stars, people who carried the measurements of the stars, the measurements of the heavens. So some of these ancient descendants were also classified as gods on earth. Divine ones, divine beings. So the many definitions and how it is and then tracing it, as I said, looking at the history and seeing, OK, this was grandfather. But now the great grandson, he come with his own swag, but he still holds the spirit of the grandfather. So we can travel and find the concurrent symbolisms of the birthmarks, the continuous birthmarks. And so when we see it pop up in society, these birthmarks, we know, OK, this is the connection of a blood lineage. This is the connection of a blood lineage. So what we're talking about is our birthmark all over the planet. How can we see our birthmark and what does it mean to us prior to our colonialization, our indoctrinization under certain romantic churchical ethics? What did we have? Because we know that they didn't bring us religion or spirituality in any form. So all they did was co-opted and corrupted it. So when we find out the points where it was co-opted and corrupted and converted and inclusions into the, the mythical science and in the historical aspects were redirected to give credence to other people, when we learn to see this, then we have rightly read into the words 
and being able to rightfully give our children their birthright. So here in the Ethiopian uh, 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 scrolls and tablets, we go back through it every time to give reference so everyone can become aware of that there are there is a massive amount of information that our ancestors left to us. And one of them is the Mithishaf Dijan Shua. Um, it is an ancient Ethiopian manuscript found in, in the Ethiopian church in Nubia. Nubia, see now, because you got Ethiopia, but they're letting you know Nubia, Ethiopia, Sudan, all of this was one empire, the Kushite Empire. So now when you and me look at it in the modern times, we tend to still put this Berlin Conference, this European borders in our ancient history, and it doesn't go there. You had kingdoms and queendoms and the borders are not how we try to make them today. So Nubia was part of the Ethiopian empire, empire, empire. So we got to understand this. So we got Nubia, Ethiopia, Sudan, Kush, even all the way up from to Jerusalem, to Syria, all the way into the Mesopotamia. We know that this is the Ethiopian Kushite empire. <laughs> And the Ethiopian Kushite Empire is designated in its first epoch with one who meets Abraham, Melchizedek. Melchizedek was king of Salem, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. And I always hear me say the Hebrew or the uh, uh, Israelite have no religion, no connection and none of these things at this time. So here is a king of God before Israel ever even said they want a king. OK, so is this why Israel wanted a king to get from under another kingdom? OK, so let's let's just figure out some of these questions. What's being interwoven into the history? So we see that before there ever was a Jesus Christ, you have a story that tells about God ordered Melchizedek. Well, let's say here I'm going to put the word L. Let's go to the Sumer. Let's go into the language of that that the 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 the, the Canaanites up to Samaria, up to uh, Syria, the Ugaric, um, all of the uh, uh, the the lands we're using, even into Egypt. So let's say El ordered Melchizedek, because Melchizedek follows the God um, El Elyon. The God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So let's say there's one named El ordering Melchizedek to send his son Ethel, whose name is Ethiop, later on, um, later on by God to go and settle in Ethiopia at the island of Lake Tana. So Ethiop goes and settles by Lake Tana near the river and later on the area where Ethel has settled. Ethel's meaning the gift of God. Um, his name is changed to Ethiopia. And then later on the land in that area after Ethel or after Ethiop or Ethiopia, um, the land becomes known as Ethiopia. So it becomes um, named after Ethiopia. So Ethel. So there is history where we find that they say that there was a Ethiopian king named Ethiop or Ethiop. Even the Greeks have Ethiop listed as one of the gods, which later on they translate Ethiop into Jupiter, into Zeus. Hear what I said? Into Jupiter, into Zeus. All right, so look at this history now, So, because we're going to move a little fast after this. Thus, not only Ethel became Ethiop, but the land in which he settled also started to be called Ethiopia. Lo and behold, 2,000 years later, descendants of Ethiop became 12 kings. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. 12 kings and then the Ethiopian Empire. So, these are the 12 kings of then the Ethiopian Empire. So, this here is a lineage and a kingdom aspect being developed so we have 12 kingdoms being created right and they headed for you know goes in the story to about bethlehem with the gifts by the star which god was said to lead so in this i'll, I'll i'm gonna move a little faster because i want to put a lot of information in here and i got a few videos i'm gonna have to show to kind of make the point so in here, you go through the blood lineage of Ethiop and Ethiop has 13 children. So we got 12 kingdoms first that are being set up. 
under the Ethiopian Empire. So 12 kings, 12 kingdoms. So each one of these 12 kingdoms, because they're coming under the Melchizedek, their leaders would be known as a Melchizedek. So this will help you kind of understand the kingly priestly right that was all of, all throughout the lands. All right. So now Ethiop begot 13 boys, um, 13 children, 10 boys, three girls, lost 10 tribes. The boys were Atib, Beor, Beora, and we're going to just take one of the lineages, right? And I want you to pay attention because you got Beor begot Aram, Aram, Aram. Got to remember that Aram. All right. Um, then Beor begot Balaam or Balaam or Balaam or Balaam, um, Balaam or Balaam. So here we have a biblical story prophet who gives this prophecy, not of Jesus, but of the star to come. And we'll we'll look at that if we have enough time What the prophecy actually said of a star to rise in the lineage, meaning uh, we'll get to that star and to that lineage and what all of that's incorporated, but it would rise in this blood lineage that was supposedly united in a in an aspect. So we have Balaam, and this Balaam is actually a descendant of Melchizedek. So again, you always hear me stress that Europeans did not consider Melchizedek a direct blood lineage on the planet. They considered him like a mythological character. So as we go through this Melchizedek lineage, this blood lineage, and go from Balaam all to Shishem, um, Shemshel, Deshet, and it takes us all into a story that takes us down here to where we start talking about the Amara, the Amara, the Hamara, the Amara and who is Aha or Aroma and Amara. Remember when we start talking about the Amara, we always talk about the Amara letters. Remember the Amara letters, the Amarna letters. This is important because that's history. So we're tracking this name Amarna and the Amarna letters, which the Amarnas or with the Aromas uh, uh, and the Aramas are one and the same people, but one group of them become more pastoral and another group of them um, divides into the warfare and administrations. So the Amara onto warfare and administrations. For example, when Oxum, Oxum, we're going to get back to this, this Oxumite, because this is important for our story, was a little boy. He was crowned as Pharaoh of Egypt by the name of Rams. And it was the Amara who accompanied him all the way from Ethiopia to Egypt in 2,850 years ago to protect his throne. About 350,000 Amaras went with him into Egypt. Right. So this is telling you that the Ethiopian lineage goes into Egypt and rules. And some of them return to Ethiopia only after 1850 years of stay in Egypt. So now when they return from Egypt, they are accompanying King Lalabella. Well, if he's leaving Egypt, going to Ethiopia and says after his return from exile in Jerusalem, mm, they built together the local Agu and the Rock Hue churches of Lalabella. So when we look at these Rock Hue churches, we're looking at things that are equivalent of the pyramids and technical development and architectural and technical development. Because these Rock Hue churches, you're talking about they just carved out a mountain. You only find this in Hasufut, in the 18th dynasty of Hasufut, the temples in the mountains that have been carved out for Hathor. So it, it's, it's a lot for us to start consuming, but look at this blood lineage. Aksumite found the city of Aksum and became the emperor of Ethiopia. He gave his daughter Ribla to the marriage of Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadnezzar. Um, of Babylon today we call it Iraq and it was the Amara soldiers who accompanied Ribla um, to Iraq and they founded a city the Amara city so they're still there today so we are tracking this history in every ever in, in many aspects to see you know that there's a lineage that came out of Melchizedek that has not really been discussed in whole. So out of this Melchizedek lineage, we just went into Egypt, into Ethiopia. We also went up into um, 
Jerusalem. We talked about this lineage goes to Oxum, to Ramsey, back to the Lalabella churches. So this is a lot of history entailed in time period that's not really touched. So let's go back up here to Quetesh. So we started the other day and we started talking about Quetesh. And one of the things we said you have to look at this art and the pictures that surrounded her where she has the headgear of Hathor. You have the God men, you have the Canaanite God, and she's standing on the lion, which the lion is El, the God El. And in her hand, she has the serpent, but she also has the blue lotus flowers of the Nile River. So this is a connection of multiple cultures under Kadesh, under Kadesh. So. When we look at this, it takes us into certain things. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go right here to prove the points again. I know I say it every time I do it, but I know the more times I say it, the more it's easier remembered. And I know the more you say it, some people don't catch it the first time, but they hear it the second time. So here they're reading from a narrative out of the Naga Hammadi. So they have found the Qumran or the Naga Hammadi scrolls. Um, these scrolls were found like 1947. Is that correct date? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, like 1947. I think that's the exact correct date. And here uh, Melchizedek appears by name. They're looking at the comparison of the story, how Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out food and drink and Abram and for all the men who were with him. And then the king of Sodom approached Abram and said, my Lord, Abram gave me and the men that are mine are captive. And you, they're talking about the king of Elam and they go into this discussion and the scholar discussions and they're saying a brief analysis and a few changes we find. Um, may prove instructive. The version smooths out Genesis account by having the king of Sodom come to Salem, therefore making Melchizedek's appearance natural. See, they didn't they didn't perceive of Melchizedek as a natural person, a natural being as it is. In, and they explain it as it is in King James Version. Melchizedek drops in from nowhere and then disappears, never to be heard of more. See, so to them, that was the end of Melchizedek. But now we're looking in the scroll and seeing Melchizedek got a whole lineage, a whole bloodline. And we know certain things about Melchizedek because he was king of Salem, of Jerusalem. So we have to study Jerusalem and Salem and understand that. When comparing this text to Genesis, one wonders what the scribes was copying as he sat. Uh, let me get a little further. It would be expected that the sacrificial elements in Melchizedek's bread and wine would have been noted since the scribe belonged to a group who championed the Zadok priesthood and could have been seen seen Melchizedek as the chief that chief of that line. The scribe rather wrote food and drink, which is closely synonymous, but subtracts the obvious sacramental qualities. So they looking at that they just made Melchizedek regular and that he gave them some food and drink. Um, but let's go a little further. Uh, where was it at? Okay. According to this text, Melchizedek acts under the directions of El, who judges the people. A significant patch passage in text finds El, the highest God, in the midst of the Elohim and other gods in his council, and another Elohim who is Melchizedek. The text reads as it is written concerning him in the hymns of David who says Elohim, Melchizedek or the Holy One, standeth in the assembly of El, the gods among the Elohim, the Holy Ones, the court of the heavenly beings, he judges. So there's a whole history with this El and this Elohim. And so when we get to our history, you know, you know, we have to look at this. What is this L and this Elohim? Is this is this just popping up now? Is it what is it? What is it? So let's go to uh, some language first, because it's a it's a word that a lot of you will find and you'll see and you'll constantly see this word. And it's Ugar, Ugaritic, Ugaric or Ugar, Ugarit. Ugaritic. I think I'm saying it right. Ugaric. Ugaric. Ugaritic. 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 
um, is an extent of the Northwest Semitic language. See, they say it's Semitic language, dialect, Amorite language, but it also is where you'll see them push this to the Canaanite. But there's components of it because I want you to see that this is a cuneiformic Hebraic alphabet, which they have put as Amoric. They mix it so it's Phoenician, Palo, Hebrew. It's a mixture. So you're looking at these names keep popping up together here. You're going to see this Phoenician, this um, Aramic um, in the Hebrew. But all of this is in the Levant area. So when you're looking at these languages and these names that are going to be popping up, I want you to think about um, that they're not really, um, you know, we kind of separate them to a point that we uh, don't put them in the right context. So including several major literatures, notably the ball cycle. Um, it has been used by scholars of the Hebrew Bible to clarify biblical Hebrew texts and has revealed ways in which the cultures of ancient Israel and Judah found parallels in neighboring cultures. The Ugaric has been called the greatest literary discovery from antiquity since the deciphering of the Egyptian hieroglyphs in the Mesopotamia cuneiforms. The Ugaric language provides this, this, this balance between it. So you hear them talking about the writings and the text that they find. So we go into, let's go look at this ball cycle first. Let's look at this ball cycle that the Ugaric text takes us to. So the ball cycle is a Ugaric cycle of stories about the Canaanite god, Baal. Oh. Well, Baal. Baal. Let's look at something. Because we're going gonna, we gonna to get this in there now. We're going we, we gonna, we gonna to figure out our way. We're going to try to figure out our way in this um oh no i went to the wrong thing sorry yeah we got to figure out our way in this where was that oh, right here so we're gonna figure out our way right here and one of the things is we stress this right here is that we find that the bible is known and he is known as belam belam or Balaam, and this is a descendant of Melchizedek. So let's, before we go a little further into this other thing, I'm going to put this name here. Um, uh, it's going to give us some names. All right. So Balaam or Balaam, and some is Balaam, and some they put it Balaam, but I guess that's how they do that language, throw you off. Um, the Wikipedia Balaam is a diviner in the Torah whose story begins in the chapters and in the ancients. And so you got the book of Balaam and Balaam and Balak in the book of Numbers. Um, here they explain that Balaam is the son of Beor or Beor. Um, and then when we go through this, it's going to teach you that he was the prophet who prophesied to Christ of the coming of the star of Jesus, where they stay don't say it was Jesus, but he prophesied the coming of a star. But as you trust, go through the history, you're going to see that they call Balaam a wicked prophet. They call him a sorcerer, but everybody goes to him to get the divine word. Um, and then as we just showed, he is the grandson of Melchizedek. Um, when they say he's a diviner, um, I always like to put this in here because you may um, have an understanding of it. You may not. Um, some of you will gain understanding of it. Some of you may stay away from because you may think how the European has taught us is paganism. Um, these symbols, you will find this in Yoruba. You will find this in the Nazareans. 
You can find this in the Sufi. You can find this as the I Ching. You can find this in India. You can find this in the Americas. You have what before you is called G Omnesy. It's the divination. If you hear people that like to say, well, I'm the oracle. One thing our ancestors knew is that nature is the oracle. It is the voice and it is the word of God. So one thing is that in the principles, nothing is by chance. Everything happens for a reason. So in the certain variations of knowing to read, if you have the proper calculations or the encodements, then you can read what nature is saying. So reading what nature is saying was part of the geomnesy science. So these 16 different forms of what we call the geomnesy symbols in Ifa is called the 16 candles. Um, these are also correlated with your 16 chakras um, coming from the earth point to the height point. Um, you know, you got more, but that's that's another correlation of it. So just remember this. So they're talking about Balaam is a uh, is a diviner. He's reading. You know, when we talk about divination, we talk about this like this magic square. Using this in a process of using the divination to do a reading. It's aligned with astrology. It's aligned with the earth and so forth. So this is something that I would tell you all to investigate more in. And it will amaze you. And if you had a tarot card reading and they did not follow through with this, then you didn't have a true reading. That's all I can tell you. Um, let's go to the next stage of, of Balaam being a diviner and why we stress that uh, that component, because we're going to back up and get it not to get too far off. But Balaam. Um, Melchizedek and Sometimes it's hard to find that little business. And that article never really comes up. I'm stuck putting that deal in there. Sorry, y'all. All right, so. All right, well, here they like to say he's not, but let's go here. Um, when you're doing the, and we'll, we'll, we'll show some components on it. The priesthood of Jesus, Melchizedek, and Oromelia. Um, why would we put Melchizedek with Oromelia? Some have said Melchizedek is believed to have been Shem for Noah and so forth, but Melchizedek has also been listed as Oromelia. I would like to find the book um, by Aiken Bioku, Jesusism. In Aiken Bioku's book, Jesusism, Aiken Bioku shows that Melchizedek's name in West Africa is Oromelia. He in Oromelia and Yoruba is the bringer of divination divination so what we just looked at when they say Balaam or Baal is um, a diviner um, that goes back into that Oromelia Yoru aspect bringing the bringer of divination um, that connector of that divinity that divine connection on earth so this 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 will play out because um, I want us to understand that through our Kushite Ethiopian heritage, 
we can reconnect all of us instead of having that division. So if we listen in, that means that the concept of the Christianity is also connected to Yoruba. So African people don't have to be divided. The concepts of Melchizedek is also connected to the Akan. So let's do a little quick here because I said I wanted to go into this. Um, try not to take too much because I am not able to download certain things. So I'm going to try to move it in fast. Just bear with me. All right. And uh, I'm going to talk about the concept of God of the Akan. Uh, the Akan call God Nyan Kupong. Nyan Kupong. This word is made up of three made morphemes. Nyam means glory. Nku is unique, all alone. And Pon is uh, mighty. Yes. So Nyan Kupong means the, the mighty and unique glory. That the glory which is unique, all alone, and mighty. Good. Now, we also call Nyangupong Odumankuma. And Odumankuma is the Akan word for nature. So, we call God Odumankuma Nyangupong, meaning nature, God Almighty. Now, it, this shows us that the Akan see nature and God as one thing. So what we refer to as nature is the, the same thing we refer to as God. Perhaps nature is the scientific name for God, and God the religious name for nature. Something of the sort. Now, I can see God as the very life, the essence of existence, the life that permeates, permeates through all things. This life has got no shape. You cannot imagine what shape it has. There's no place where it starts and there's no way, place where it ends. It avoids vacuum. And it is the manifestation of this God, which is in all forms. So every physical thing, every, every thing that has been created. Hi, I'm Dawn. And I run a company called Jotful. We make one-of-a-kind right, websites Dawn, just on. like these Feel on out the way. right here in Michigan. We figured out a way to... It has been born, like been given birth to by this God. Now, uh, God, the concept which has been brought here by the... Uh, by the European through Christianity is actually lower than the concept of God of the Akan. Because, as already said, the Akan sees God as life itself, the essence of existence. So, the Akan cannot imagine God of any shape, which is correct, because God has no shape. It's shapeless. It's beyond shape. In the same sense, God is beyond existence in time. So there's no time when God started to exist. Or when life started to exist. And there is no time when life is going to end in existence. In other words, there's no time when God is going to end existence. If as soon as life ceases to exist, everything ceases to exist. Therefore, life is God, and God is life. It's not as, as if God is the source of life. God is life itself. And this life, as already said, created everything. 
or gave existence. So anything that exists has its life by proxy to God. Now, creation, as I have already mentioned, is the coming into being of any entity to which God has given birth. We, uh, I can't see the creation as being of different levels or hierarchy, if I can put it that way. Thus, in the creation, God first created spiritual beings. Then, God created gaseous beings, gases, uh, liquid, uh, earth, that's uh, what, uh, the, like, like oxygen, hydrogen, all sort of air. Then, from there, God created liquid beings. Then from liquid to solid beings. The Akan has the notion that anything, whether it's solid, can transform into liquid form, into, into gaseous form, and even into spirit. In the same way, we hold the notion that any spirit can also transform into liquid or into gas, be become liquid and become physical thing. So, as I'm talking to you now, a, 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 a god, one of the all of the spirits, for these spirits are also called gods in Akan. Any of these can manifest itself into a being, a human being, and come and sit here. In the same way, an ordinary hu really human being, like as, as I'm sitting here now, can vanish into thin air. We have, they can't have the power to do that. There are the signs, and it's still, it's not lost. We still have it. Now, because God created the spirit beings, and we call these gods, the Akan drum language, or the Akan, Akan drum poetry, says that, Uchiri Mpong, ah, Obo Enyame. Uchiri Mpong, ah, Obo Enyame. Uchiri Mpong means the reliable God. So, Uchiri Mpong, ah, Obo Enyame, the reliable God, that God Almighty, who created the gods. Good. Now, these gods, that have been mentioned uh, are supposed to have human shapes. Perhaps they have different shapes, but I can't consider them as having the shape of human beings, although they are in the spirit form. And the days of the Akans, the seven days of the Akans, are named each after a god. The god of Saturday is Amen, or Amen. And it's sometimes called Amira. Now, because of this, anybody born on Saturday is called Kwa Amin. My own name is Kwa Amin. But in pronunciation, it becomes corrected to Kwa Amin, as you have in Kwa Amin, Kroma. His name was Kwa Amin because he was born on Saturday. Now, the God of Sunday is called Asi. And because of this, any male born on Sunday is Kwasi. The god of Monday is Ajo. And it is believed that it is this same god that in ancient Egypt was called Juite. Because the god is called Ajo, any male born on Monday is Kwa Ajo. Now, the god of Tuesday is Abena. And any male born on Tuesday is Kwabena. The god of Wednesday is called Awuku and any male born on Wednesday is called Kwawuku which is corrupted. Now remember to keep in mind the language and that you're hearing from the African mind, the Kushite, the, the Hamedic, however you want. I'm putting these names with it so you can catch what I'm saying. But we're listening to this Kushite mind speak from the Kushite intellect on the perceptions of nature and God. So now when we start looking back at this history and the concepts of religion, I want you to see them paralleled in certain realities. The Akan are ones that said that they fled Egypt 
during the invasion. The Yoruba are those that said that they fled Egypt during the invasion. So the priesthoods that come out with them are priesthoods that came out of Egypt during the invasion. The Dogon said that they fled Egypt during the invasion. So you have the Dogon, the Akan, the Yoruba, and so all of these things are relevant to our story, how our story is composed and what it means to our story and how we unveil his story. So let's continue a little further in getting more of this Kushite mind. The God of Thursday is Yahweh. And a male born on Thursday may be called Kwa Yao or Kwa or Yao. Now, if you say Kwa, it is Kwa Yao, which has been contracted, brought together to form Kwa. The God of Friday is Afi. And any male born on Friday may be called Kwa Fi, which has been corrupted to Kofi in present day. So we see all the seven gods. Now, uh, the proof that the, the god Amen, which has been recognized as an ancient Egyptian god, is the Saturday god of the Akan, is not only in the name Amen. We have a name like Jamin, which is Ja and Amen, which actually mean except Amen. This the longer form of this name is Jamira, which means except Amira. When you come to the Sunday God called Asi, we have a, uh, the same form of compounding, which is Jasi. So we have Jamira, except Amira, and Jasi, except Asi. Yes. And then we have names like Aminama or Amen Gifts. The reason is that in ancient days, or even now in the villages, if a woman cannot give birth, is found to be buried, she is taken to a god, and directly the god can give the woman a child. Then the woman, after getting this child, will say, this is a gift from this or that god. And if the god Amin gives you a child, you call the name Aminama, and the Zimas will say, we realize by this explanation that what the Western world consider as God is just one of the gods of ancient Egypt. And actually, it is the god Yao, which is the Thursday god of the Akan. The name of this god was spelled Y-A-H-W in ancient Egypt. And the Encyclopedia of Religion will tell you that it was this word into which the vowels of the Hebrew word Adonia were infixed by Moses to get Yehovah. So the god Yahweh or Yehovah is an Akan god. And uh, I have every conviction that it was this god who was worshipped by the Israelites or the Jews or the Hebrews when they stayed in Egypt for 460 years. So when they were going back, they had to adopt no other god but the god they had been acquainted with as a national god. Now, uh, having seen that the main god which the Christians are selling back to Africa is just one of the gods of the seven days of the Akan, we, I, I want to explain uh, that the first establishment that the Akan set up when they arrived in West Africa here was named after the god Amira. And the town is called Amonji. It is uh, situated, no, it was situated about 18 miles from present day Techiman. Or um, 6 miles um, from present day Nkwanza at a place called Pinehi. The old town Amori is no more, but there is a rock which gave them water.
They said Amor Reed. Amor Reed. What? So he says Amor Reed. I would like to stress that um, before he goes a little further. So we're going to use this as a basis to follow through. So we're getting this Amin-Ra. We're getting this Akan that is attached to this. So let's go a little further. Hold on. Right here. So one of the things I always stress is this book here. Our elder sister, Drusilla Houston, published this book in 1926. I should say it right. Yes, 1926. So, this is tell you that the information. Um, she goes into depths right here. I'm going to try to let me make sure I get it. Now. I don't want to go too far in it, but I want to hit it with the right points. Hold on. Okay, this is it. I can go from right here. So the origin of civilization, the minds of men today are stirred with eager questions about the origin of civilization and about the part the different races of mankind played. In its development from primitive ages, the remainings that are archaeologists, the archaeologists are uncovering in Egypt and old Babylon is in old Babylon and South America reveal that there are significant factors for the first development. Now, see, we're talking about the development of creation. We're talking about the development of creation. And as we're talking about this development, we're seeing that there's significant factors. The first development of art and development of arts and science and history has failed to make clear. So this is why we're on our story. Because they didn't make our story clear. And if we don't make our story clear, our story will never be clear and our life will never be clear. So scientists are busy today studying the types of those old civilizations and comparing them with those of the present. Our modern systems do not function for the masses to give them development and happiness as did some of the ancient cultures. So let's go through here. So we're talking about this Kushite Ethiopian culture. Um, so this is important. Our story will deal with the ancient Kushai Empire of Ethiopians that covered three continents and held unbroken sway for 3,000 years. So I want you to understand this now because there's a, so much history. Listen, the Kushai Empire was on three continents and held unbroken control for 3,000 years at least. We will visit old Ethiopia, where, as Harada said, the gods delighted to banquet with the pious inhabitants. So the, the old way they perceived our ancestors were they were the gods of the earth. So we will study the land in the ancient race. The old race will next win our attention. Petri found in Egypt of distinct and unique culture who were the people of early and superior civilizations of the first dynasty down through the prehistoric visit to happy Arabia. So all throughout of the lands of Yemen, Arabia, look here, centuries old Chaldea, which belonged to the ancient Kushite empire of Ethiopians. Next comes the veiled and the mysterious India and scheme and scenes of charming stories and magic fables with her substal mysticism and philosophies tearing a while with the conquest and life of the ancient Medes and the Persians. The trail runs far afield into the dominions of Western Europe, even into Scotland and Ireland. The striking questions array themselves, demanding to be answered. Who were the Celts? Who were the Teutons? And what was the origin of the so-called Aryan race? The author was most much astounded, as will be the reader, as to what this study reveals. We learned the study of the races of Western Europe to understand the hatred of Europe that underlaid the world war. We learned that when the Celts and the Teutons called the Ethiopians of the New World uncle and auntie, 
They are using titles that are scientifically true. Our story passes on to another remnant of the ancient Kushite Empire, baffling races, the Iberian, you call it Spain, now requested by the Basqua. Then to the, Ber Ber the Berbers of North Africa, another branch of the Kushite race. Kushite. Kushite. Some scientists have called themselves the descendants of the peoples of Atlantis. Next succeeded the singular facts about the life of the mysterious Etruscans, who were before the Greeks and the Italians. You had the Etruscans. The Carthage before who were the, before the the before Rome. So the Etruscans of old Italy were the teachers of the Rome, or they became later on as Carthians, and then they became known later on as the Greeks and the Romans as they were overrun. Then we will follow the life and the tragedy of the fleeting Pelagians, who were the fountain out who 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 the fountain out of which later the Greeks cultured weld, um, welded. They were the people of the legends of the Greek mythology. So let's go a little further. In chapter on ancient Kushite commerce, we follow the ships of these earlier daring, skillful seamen who before the dawn of history had blazed out the ocean trails that the Phoenicians later followed. We find irrefutable evidence of the presence of these daring conquerors in primitive legends and religions and institutions of America. Next out, the dim haze of a far antiquity rises the distinct lines of Ant Atlantis of old, the race that gave civilization to the world, the race that tamed the animals and gave us domestication of plants, the gods of the ancient world were the kings and queens of mystic Atlantis. The chapter the gods of old makes plain that the deities of Greece and Rome were also the kings and queens of ancient Kushite empire of Ethiopia. So when we read their books and they tell us that we there's this gods here and these gods here, we have to be very careful because sometimes they're just talking about grandmama, grandpa, and we're seeing their birthmarks everywhere. Which was either the successor of the most famous branch of the Atlantic race, it was about these princes and heroes that all the wonderful mythologies of ancient was woven. They were the deities that were worshipped in India, Chaldea, Egypt, and Greece, and Rome, which nations themselves must have been related to the race of Atlantis that tradition said had been overwhelmed by the sea. Even the Kibra Nagas on the Ethiopian books of which people consider the value of like the Bible speaks of the Ethiopian lineages in all of these areas. For her rulers were the subjects of arts and literatures of all primitive nations until the fall of what they call the paganism and long after the birth of Christ. Another division of the Atlantis was the transatlantic America. There, the mysterious mound builders represent the ancient Kushite race. We studied the peculiar culture and the genius of the fierce Aztecs who acknowledged that he received the germs of civilization from the earlier Kushite inhabitants. I wonder if that's why when his impure majesty Ali Selassie came and the Sioux Nation gave him the title Great Buffalo and the buffalo was considered one of the great um, symbols of God to them. So we have to understand that there is a connection that goes in antiquity of the truth of the Kushite Ethiopian Empire, who were the royal kingly priests of many lands, who the stories of the Prester John and the stories of the Balaam or the Balaam priest of Americas, the leopard print. So we pass southward and examine the high development of the wonderful Mayans of North America whose ruins are attracting special study today and we find they're transplanted the Kushite arts of the ancient world. Next flash, the pictures of marvelous culture and arts of the Incas. 
superior to those of Western Europe in 1492. From America, the story turns to the Bronze and Iron Age. We seek the origin of the mysterious bronze implements of Western Europe found in the hands of seemingly as barbarous people. So our history as Kushite Ethiopians is so in depth that they will never teach it to us. They have our story veiled in his story so that we cannot see our story. So when you hear me deal with the Hebrew and the Kushite versus the Israel and he, I mean the Kushite and Ethiopian versus the Hebrew and Israel, it is not a religious thing. It is to do a positioning of our story in the religious context as it shows our true history. You know, so what are we looking at? And one of the things I have to stress this is that when we're looking at this, let me go right back here so I can get this right. And I can make a good point right here while I'm sitting here on this one here. When we looking at this history, we're looking at the wives of Abram. Sarah is Chaldea, Hagar is Egypt, and Katara is Ethiopians. So this story of the trod of Abram going through is going through the three Kushite empires. Remember the Kushite empire was on, on continent spread out everywhere. So now when we start thinking about this story, we watch the story where in every essence of what we call the biblical text, the male characters of the Abram line have to marry a Cushite queen, royalty, every time to properly claim their position in the birthrights of the God's chosen people. What do you mean? Well, well, let's just start with Abraham. Sarah is the princess, but they're in the land of Chaldea. The Chaldeans go to an individual. Who do the Chaldeans go to? Well, let's 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 go a little further. Let's keep it keep it moving. The Chaldeans would take us to Nimrod. But Nimrod, the son of Cush. Therefore, the great grandson of Noah, Nimrod, was described as a king in the land of Shinar, Mesopotamia. So we go to understanding that Nimrod leaves from the Cush area and goes to the land of Akkad or Shinar or Mesopotamia. So we have to kind of look at that. And they call him a mighty hunter before the Lord which is another encodement, which gives us a birthmark because anytime we get the mighty hunter before the Lord, we're starting to get symbolism of the belt of Orion. We're starting to get that, that star science of Orion, you know, so that gets us closer to the star Sirius and so forth. So we start realizing, okay, when they put these encodements is this got something to do with our people. So Nimrod, is where we go to for that little Chaldean aspect. So let's go a little further. Um, since we got this concept, uh, and I hope we kind of could see that this Kushite Empire um, is very important, you know, for in the last 3,000 years, the world has been mainly indebted to Semitic Indo European races for its advancement. But it was otherwise in the first stage, ages. Egypt, Babylon, Mesmerim, and Nimrod, both descendants of Ham, led the way in acts as pioneers of mankind in various untrodden fields of arts, science, literature, alphabetical writings, astronomy, history, chronology, architect, plastic art, sculpture, navigation, agriculture, textiles, industries seem to have had their origin in one or the other of these countries. The taming of animals was a gift of us to these prehistoric men. By skills and perseverance, they developed from wild plants, from wheat, oats, rice that are foundation of our agriculture. So 
this was works this this work was done so many ages ago that their wild origin has disappeared the average man little realizes the gifts of the prehistoric ages or how how, how helpless we would be without them today so what our ancestors gave to humanity is what we're surviving on but yet it's not known we're given this semitic indo-european advancement concept in the history of our ancestors is erased. The first inventors of any art among the greatest benefactors of mankind in the bold steps they take from the known to the unknown, from blank ignorance to discovery, are equal to many subsequent steps of progress. Bunsen says the philosophy says in his philosophy of ancient history, the Hamedic family, as Rawlinson proves, must be given the credit for being the fountainhead of civilization. This family comprised the ancient Ethiopians, the Egyptians, the original Canaanites and the old Chaldeans. So we one family here. The inscriptions of the Chaldean monuments prove their race affinity. The Bible proves their relationship. It names the sons of Ham as Cush, Mesmerine, Put and the race of Canaan. Mesmerine, people of Egypt and Canaan, the land later possessed by the Hebrews, later possessed. Put located in Africa and Cush extends its colonies over a wide domain. Cush extends its colonies over a wide domain. Bunsen concludes by saying Kushite colonies were all along the southern shores of Asia and Africa and by the archaeological remains along the southern and eastern coasts of Arabia. The name Kush was given to four great areas, the Mid Midia, Persia, Susana and Aria and the whole territory between the Indus and the Tigris in prehistoric times. In Africa, the Ethiopian, the Egyptians, the, Libyan, the Libyans and the Canaanites and the Phoenicians were all descended of Ham. They were the black or the dark colored race, the pioneers of our civilization. They were emphatically the monument builders on the plains of Shinar in the valley of Nile from Mero to Memphis. In southern Arabia, they erected the wonderful edifice. They were the responsible for the monuments that dotted southern Siberia and in America along the valley of the Mississippi down to Mexico and in Peru. Their images and monuments stand as voiceless witnesses. This was the ancient Kushite empire of Ethiopians that covered three worlds. Some of our later books recognizing their indisputable influence in primitive cultures. The Ethiopian Kushite Empire. Now, when we talk about them in the Americas and so forth, you know, to some people, you know, I'm going to go back to their con to finish it up. But um, we gonna we going to touch some stuff. And we're going to come back. But let's let's go here right quick. The Exumite people were Ethiopian people, or people who lived in East Africa. Although we know much about the Exumite Empire, very little is known about the Exumites who discovered America hundreds of years ago. In the 21st century, there are many Ethiopian communities in the Western Hemisphere. Although we believe that this is the first time that Ethiopians have been here in great numbers, it would appear that during the Arwe and Exumite empires, Semitic or Pointite speaking Ethiopians discovered South America, explored South America, and left many ancient artifacts. There are many elements of Ethiopian civilization civilization found in South America. Between 1300 BC and AD 600, blacks from East Africa and Asia began settling in South America. Many African skulls have been found in Ecuador, in sections of Chile, and in Valdivia, among the Pinueco of Peru. 
Carlos Marquez and Estudios Archaeologias y Ethnográficas notes that it is good to report that long ago the U4 America was also a Negro continent. Marquez insisted that the Otomis of Mexico, the Caracola of Haiti, the Aguas of Culara, the Aravos of Orinoco, the Porcias and Matayas of Brazil, Manabis of Quito, the Chuanas of Darien, and the Albinos of Panama are the remains of the former African tribes that settled, civilized, and lived in the Americas. Ecuador has provided much archaeological evidence for the presence of Africoids in South America. One of the greatest finds was a magnificent stone head of a male wearing a circular earring on his right ear. This head is similar to the carving of Akhenaten. Dr. Von Woodnall had identified this figure as representing the Negroid element in pre-classical Ecuador. Jacinto Camano notes that of the skulls discovered in Ecuador, many were blacks, especially among the Mochicas. In Punin, he noted that practically all the skulls were of Africoid and Oceanic type, and at Tijuanaco, Peru, there are numerous carvings of blacks that have been discovered. Moreover, persistent oral traditions around Lake Titicaca recalled the bearded people who were exterminated by Indians. These bearded people were African. According to Lanning, there was a possible movement of Negritos from Ecuador into Piura Valley, north of Chicama and Viru. He believes there is a relationship between this culture and the Valdivia site, which was active from 1800 BC to AD 100. Dr. Dixon said Val de Villa was inhabited by Africoid people. There are many correlates between Ethiopia and early Ecuador and Peru. In Peru on ceramic pots, large double-decked boats are depicted which are almost identical to the papyrus boats used in the Proto-Sahara and ancient Punt. On the lower deck of the boat are painted a number of water jars and other cargo, along with rows of people. On the upper deck, there stood the earthly representation of the sun god Ra, the same as the sun god of Mero in Egypt, surrounded by birdmen who were handling the ropes to propel the ship through the water. The interesting thing about these pictures is that they are almost exact replicas of scenes depicted on the Egyptian pyramids. Today, boats made of bundles of reeds lashed together are found in Ethiopia. Along the Peruvian coast and at Lake Titicaca, where tradition has it, that bearded men were destroyed by the local Amerindians. Indians. There are other similarities between Ethiopia and Peru, Ecuador. The Ethiopians used battle clubs in war. As a result, their doctors became skilled in trepanning or true cranial surgery without killing the patient. This operation was unknown to Europeans until after Columbus discovered America. Yet it was known to the Peruvians. Both groups also used false beards on mummies, the ancient Peruvians manufactured bricks of sun-dried clay mixed with straw using the same formula of the Egyptians and Ethiopians. The Peruvian adobes were made in a rectangular mold, just like in Ethiopia, and Peruvians and Ethiopians used a horizontal loom staked on the ground, along with the vertical frame loom with two warp beams. Von Hagen noted that the looms used by the ancient Peruvians are identical with those of other civilizations with which they had allegedly absolutely non contact. A form of backstream loom was used in Egypt. A horizontal loom appears in pre-dynastic Egypt, and the one pictured on the tomb of Kinelotep at Beni Hassan circa 1900 BC is identical with those of Andean and coastal Peruvian. The Ethiopian explorers in America who landed in Peru, Ecuador, probably reached here originally by accident. Yet, the considerable number of blacks with beards on Machica Ark so there were many of these Azumites living among the Mochicas. So, as you see there, we're going to go a little further in that. And I want you to be looking at these symbolism, looking at these boats and seeing these things. I want you to think about this. Because this is history of our story that is not being told and not being made clear. So, Let's 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 go a little further. I want to put a picture up right quick first, 
so that we can see something and get a statement here. All right. East African invasion in South America, tracing cultural clues and artifacts left by early travelers. Archaeologists have found many artifacts suggest that blacks lived in pre-Columbian America in locations including uh, Teohonaka and Vadiva epigrapher and archaeologists have even found evidence that the Aksumites, the Meroites, the Puttites, all this is Kushite, may have voyaged to South America before Columbus. There is also ample evidence that the Sumerians, Kushite, Chaldea, Nimrod, were in South America, which they called, excuse me, which they called Kungaki, Kungaki. It was here that the Sumerians mined tin and other minerals. So you got to understand this now. So the ancient kingdoms are traveling to the Americas doing mining work. East Africans probably learned about Ecuador and Peru. So you got a group. Let's think about Nimrod's time that go up and they start. I don't need you to do that because I don't want no video. So they go up and they start. Um, they're mining in the Americas. So during the Arwi or the Aksumai empires, which we will go over, Semitic Apuntite speaking Ethiopians travel to South America. Well, not only did they travel to South America, they came into the Americas. So I uh, just want us to have evidence for early Ethiopians in the Andean regions between 13,000 B.C. 680 blacks from East Africa. This was traveling and they were building cities and they were setting up mine expeditions and so forth. So when we get that, this is this is a whole nother element of what's going on. So let me go to the next thing. Let's 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 get a little more information here. And then let's see if we can add it up. <clears throat> so we're going to look at a little bit of little Bible history here. Um, just to get a little story, a little storyline on some things, just to get something. And then we're going to go back to this Akan and then we're going to touch up this Melchizedek can bring us back around. All right. So remember the Canaanite, Cushite, Ethiopian. All of these right here. And then you got Amorite, one of his sons, Amorite. And that's where you get the Amorites. They're Canaanites. Okay. As you guys can see, Canaanites, Sidonians, Hittites, and Jebusites. The Jebusites are the ones that Joshua encountered in the city of David in Jerusalem when he, when he regained it, the holy city. He took on a lot of these Amorite, Jebusite, Hittite, Sidonian, Canaanite nations when he was taken back to Holy Land. Again, remember this now. When we read the Circle 7 Quran, we get the other side of it. Thomas Drew letting us know that the ancient Moabites no, and the Canaanites were expelled from Canaan by Joshua. I don't know why he said Thomas Drew. And we're going to go back to uh, the book. So again, we're back in the dictionary. So again, the Danans attempted to settle south in the vicinity of Sora and Eshtao. This attempt failed and that with indigenous Amorites, indigenous Hamites or Canaanites, the Amorites, immigrant Philistines, and Israeli groups such as the Judahites and Ephraimites, all right, from the tribes of Ephraim, 
As a result, the Danites migrated during the period of the judges, and a Levite priest in Mount Ephraim along the way and discovered Laish, a city both rich and resourced. A war party of 600 warriors soon followed and took the city, which they renamed in honor of their tribal ancestor, the Danites. Forced the Levite priest to accompany them. Now listen to this. Listen to what the Danites did. He founded the sanctuary at Dan. The Danite territory was largely confined to this single urban center. All right, and we're going to read what he made the Levite priest do. Possibly some Danites remain in the south the core of which Solomon's second administrative district may have preserved. Now, as a real quick, go back to the genealogical chart. We got Ham again, Ham, and his son Canaan, and Mizraim. And from this, we get Kathorim, who is the father of Philistines, the progenitor of the Philistines, all right? These are Hamites, Philistines. We're going to read a lot about the Philistines and their relationship with the Israelites and the Danites. All right, these were mostly enemies. These are all Cushites. Israelites. This is all family. Continuing the dictionary, it says in many aspects the Danites are unusual. They apparently did not have many clans. Only one is listed, and sometimes they are referred to as a clan rather than as a tribe. The Danites were the only tribe who failed to hold or receive a tribal allotment. They are criticizing the son of Deborah for failing to join the Israelite coalition against the Canaanites, right? The Danites were like, nah, nah you guys on your own. The best known Danite, Samson, was the most uncharacteristic of the judges. The tribal blessing, Genesis 49, 17, Dan shall be a snake by the... So pay attention now, the Danites did not join in the war against the Canaanites. The Danites did not join in the war against the Canaanites. Is it maybe because there may be a mixture of the story of who the people are? So it's going to come a little further. Dan shall be a snake by the roadside for the viper along the path. By the roadside, a viper along the path may reflect a reputation for violence. Nothing about the Danite conquest of Laish belies such a reputation. Jacob's deathbed words about Dan. Dan shall judge his people, right? He shall judge. He's the judge as one of the tribes of Israel. Have an enigmatic quality and have left some wondering whether the Danites like full tribal status at some point. Another question about Danites is the relationship to other ethnic groups with similar names migrating in the region near the end of the second millennium, all right? So basically, this is going to get into what I'm going to get into with you guys. I'm going to show you guys who the Danites became. Now, they're talking about their relationship to other ethnic groups, huh? So it's here, Greek records named the Danaoi. Phoenician records, the Dinim. And Egyptian, the Danyan and Danuna. All may be linked. The evidence is inconclusive. All right, we're going to show the different sources. Now, you guys decide, you know, but we know that historically the thing. So now if we look at it, this terminology, the Danoi, the Danim, but they are carriers of a symbol of a serpent. And they're also known as seafarers, just like the Phoenicians, the Philistines. Um, which is listed here, the Phoenicians, Egyptians. So it's where you start to understand that there is a mixture of a historical story that's in place. So let me get to this next thing. Uh, let's go right here. Is that I uh, hit the right one? Yeah. All right. So 
if you look here, the tribe of Dan is not in the book of Revelations. The book of Revelations chapter 7 tells us of 12,000 from each tribe being sealed to give a quick overview. The chapter is about the incoming destruction of Rome and this part is where it is monumentarily suspended while the tribes could be sealed. This assures a sufficient number of Israelites will survive the judgment. All right, so when you look here, there's things again where they got the tribe of Dan. When you examine various forms of Norse rooms, compare them to the Hebrew Phoenician alphabets, you will notice how strikingly so similar to others they are. And if we have understanding that the Israelites migrated to Europe and that we are the same people as the old. Now, just remember, we just talked about the Ethiopian Cushite. Right. We we brought our alphabet and language with us, including the tribe of Dan, since our ancestors were deported by the Syrians and for a time prolonged procreation society, as well as the Mendes of Persians. Our language are also picked up. So this is like a dedicated saying, you know, they're trying to put it back with the Hebrew as the first or so forth. But they are showing you that there is a connection between this Phoenician and so forth. And as we see that this is found in certain Scotland and Ireland areas as well. Let me see if we can go to the next stage right quick to kind of get a little bit of this back here. Uh, where did I put it at? Uh, Excuse me. Well, I got to go to Ireland. Ireland. Where did I put that Ireland? So it's got to be out here where I was going at. Okay, so we keep getting this Phoenician and so forth. Make sure this is the right. Uh, uh, okay. small right now yeah. um journey for two more days and some more of these cops is okay all right here we go uh i'm trying to think where to start on this just to make it clear so we can get some little building and i don't want to go too far in it because the because the, i ain't touching the punic wars or the punic judge the distance um you had the carthage you're gonna have to deal with the language of punic um, many writers argue that Babotus and the Crocodile River Gambia system shows that Gambia has a long stretch south water. Um, the Carthians journeyed for 12 more days and saw more of Ethiopes that fled on the approach of Hano's fleet. Um, the the interpreter Hano had with him found the speeches of Athiops unintelligible. Lacanthus regarded likely that the Carthians had reached a region where the Mande or Mandian subsection of the Nigeria Congo subset, superset had been replaced by the speaker of that language, also part of the Niger Congo family called Creole or Cru, and that Hannah took on new interpretations when needed as indicated. Well, I kind of pulled this up. It was it's it's an in depth history. I I don't think I want to go into all of this, um, because it's more about showing. Uh, the travels of the Phoenicians and the connections with these African empires. So here it goes to Benin. Um, here we were saying Ethiopia, Ethiopia, and that the Car um, so the Car Car the Carthaginians and then the Phoenicians and that connection. So as we dealt earlier in 
the wonderful Ethiopian Kushite Empire, showing that this empire extended into all of those communities. This is why when Europeans try to tell us our history, they always talk about it seems difficult because it seems like these people overlap these people and these old people overlap these people and um, they kind of like these people, but they're not these people or they have this tribal name, but not really this tribal name. So when we go into that, we come into this Ethiopian history where Ethiopia has what's called the serpent symbol. Now, I need to understand the serpent symbol because the tribe of Dan carried the same serpent symbol. Um, okay, well, shoot. I think I'm going to have to go and let it play a little further right quick. So let's, let me see, move it up. Uh, does he go through the serpent symbol here? Okay, yes, he does. So hold on, give me one minute, let me get this out of the way. So he does go through the serpent symbol in here, so that's going to be good. Um, so let's see how it speaks about the tribe of Dan and the serpent symbol Keeping before I go. Of one of their progenitors on the Hamite side, right, on the Philistine side. According to Y. Jadin, the biblical references of Dan, the form Shuham, Shuham occurs in numbers, right? Now it says here, Shuham, a Danite, right? Shuham, right? Hamite, ancestor, intermarrying with Ham. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna make a point here. I like this brother's build, uh, whoever is Karimio or Karimo, um, but he is in denial of the Kushite connection to this. Um, I love that he wants to make it um, indigenous Native American, um, and he does say that the indigenous Native Americans are black. So I love his research. Um, so he is dealing with that, but he does not have not come to the point to really acknowledge the real truth of the Kushite Ethiopian Empire. So he's also following the European concept of, well, you hear it, that when they say these people got married or they shouldn't have been with these people, why were they with these people? But if you follow the tribe of Dan, Ephraim, and Joseph, you will see that there's a special encodement with all three of those that mean something. So give thanks. Let's go to the next stage. Are the Danites. All right, so we see a connection with Danites and Hamites. Just real quick, going back to Urban's Dictionary of the Bible. So we got Hushim earlier was one of the sons of Dan, or a descendant of Dan, right? As it says here, a son of Dan. The form Shuham, Shuham occurs in numbers, right? Now it says here, Shuham, a Danite, right? Shuham, right? Hamite. Ancestor of the Shuhamite Hamite clans. Shuhamite Hamite clans. Let's go back again. Samson's experience shows that despite the attempt to preserve the purity of the family, tribe, and nation by not intermixing with the nations of the land, social contact and even marital ties were established between the Danite clans and the Philistines, Hamites. So it makes sense that he would name his son Duham keeping the name of one of their progenitors on the Hamite side, right, on the Philistine side. According to Y. Jadin, the biblical references prove that at a certain stage of Dan's settlement, the tribe enjoyed the closest relationship with the Sea Peoples, okay? The Danites were Sea Peoples. They were mixing with them, and they were the... All right, hold up. You see how he said he got to go back, and he says, and they were the Sea People. So the Danite we're mixing with the sea people important here because this is us and so when you start hearing about these intermingled wars and so forth it's 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 going to get very clear that some of us left home and some of us came back and some of us seen who came in power while we were gone we didn't like and there were internal wars so you have to get this um we'll also go into um, Dagon, the Dogon, and El and Baal, and how this also goes back to the Sea People and the Canaanites, and that we can see that our story.
is a lot greater than what they've revealed to us. So let's go a little further and we'll tie it all in. The Sea Peoples. A large part of those ancient Sea Peoples were Danites. That's what we're going to get into. This is why I'm doing this video so we can understand as we proceed with our research and go into other topics. When we start talking about Phoenicians and Sea Peoples. Now you guys know already, Phoenicians came out of Atlantis, so-called Canaan. That was America, the real promised land. That was so we just read that the Kushite Ethiopian. This is the Kushite Ethiopian story. So you hear him doing the research and seeing that even in the scriptural Bible, how they tell you the tribe of Dan, it's really an encodement kind of with Ham and it confuses them because then they're with the sea people who was part of that Hamite, Philistine, Phoenician, Cushite, Oxamite. Oxamite. Legacy. was over here. So it coincides with what they're saying here, right? That Dan has received people. Dan's coming from the promised land too the real one and remember the videos we did on the ancient navigators of america we know we had the capabilities we've been doing it for thousands of years our ships they call them canoes but they fit about 150 to 200 people some of them these were just like the so-called phoenician or viking ships made out of one tree we had huge trees here in the americas the real lebanon So as we see this, that makes us think about that Cushite history, because that's important. That, 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 that Cushite history has left us where the stories don't make no sense of what happened in ancient times. So we have to get back to solving these mysteries. Continuing, that Dan was an ancient tribe that extended over the entire east. And that during this early period, it had no connection with the confederacy of the tribes of Israel. It gradually moved closer to the tribes of Israel until it was accepted into the Amphitheony and became one of them. Its original area of settlement was along the coast near Jaffa, in the region between the settlements of the Philistines and those of the Tejekur mentioned in Egyptian records. In Jatin's view, there is a close relationship between the tribe of Dan and the tribe of Danaoi, okay? Again, they're telling you who are the Danans or the Danaoi of Greece, ancient Greece. These ancient so-called Greeks. You trust Whose me. members were clearly seafarers, all right? Seafarers who had a propensity for the worship of the sun and whose heroes excelled in their talent for solving riddles. Minra. The factions of the tribe wandered as fighting troops, spread to different places that come of the Danites, and founded cities, which they named for the patriarchs of the tribe. These groups of the tribe of the Danaoi were particularly attracted to the East Mediterranean coast in general, and the Jaffa area in particular. The similarities between their history and that of the tribe of Dan led Jadin to suggest the identification of the two. It is possible, however, to explain the parallels as resulting from contact and influence. Moreover, there does not appear to have been any contact between the Sea Peoples and the tribe of Dan before the migration of the latter to the north under Amorite pressure. The information about Dan from the period of the monarchy until the destruction is negligible. It would seem that with the founding of the monarchy, the Danite clans in the south were assimilated into the kingdoms of Judah and Israel and lost their distinctiveness. As for those in the north, they appeared to have been concentrated around the city of Don, the importance of which increased after the division of the kingdom. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, all right? Jeroboam, if you guys know scripture, he was the first king of Israel. They mean ten tribes, which does not include Judah or Benjamin. All right, this is when they were separated. So there was the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah at this time. Now listen to what Jeroboam did. Jeroboam established a central royal sanctuary in Dan, the northern end of its king, and placed in it one of the two golden calves of the worship of the God of Israel. In an attempt to renew the ancient cultic centers and to revive the early traditions in order to remove the members of the northern kingdom from contact with Jerusalem and its temple. The Danite clans of the north apparently intermingled with their neighbors. 
especially the tribe of Naphtali, and even with the people of Tyr, all right, even with the people of Tyr, who were the Tyrians. So again, the Danites intermixing, right? So if they're mixing with the people of Tyr, wouldn't they become Tyrians too, their sons? And then in history, people will forget that they were Danites too. I right, just think about that. Remember, Kim Hiram, his mom was a Danite. And then it says his dad was a man of Tyr. Could that man of Tyr could also be a Danite? Since we know Danites were there mixing with the Tyrians. And so he says Hiram, King Hiram, is a Danite and Tyre. So when you get to talking about the mysteries in, in Freemasonry and the mystery of Solomon and Hiram Abiff and Hiram, you have to understand what this is this is leading into again. So let's go a little further. We're gonna speed it up. We're about to close it out. It's in that area. The territory of Dan in the north constituted in the northern flank of the kingdom of Israel, and it suffered in the struggles and wars between Israel and Aram and between Israel and Assyria. So again, Israel was battling with the Aramites. That's the son of Shem, descendants of Shem, but they're not Israelites, right? They're not descendants of Arphishan. And between Israel and Assyria, and Assyrians, again, also sons of Shem. These are all Shemitic, right? Or Semitic, fighting amongst each other. Again, Assyrians are from Ashur, another son of Shem, but not from Arphishad, again, where Eber and Abraham come from. And the time of King Basha of Israel, the cities of Don, Ijon, Dan, and Abel, Beth, Makkah were conquered by Ben-Hadad. King of Aram, who had been hired by King Asa of Judah. All right, so you see that? All right, so you see, the tribe of Judah was at war with the Danites because they were over there allowing Jeroboam and the king of Israel to, you know, put idols in the temples. And the Danites were mixing with, again, the Philistines and the people of Tyre. In the time of Pekah, king of Israel, the territory of Dan, together with that of Naphtali and the whole of Galilee, was conquered by Tigla. Elazer the third and its inhabitants were exiled to Assyria they were sent as exiles remember in this region he established the Assyrian province of Megiddo all right Megiddo that's where Dan was Megiddo or Armageddon that's where the word Armageddon comes from from Megiddo that's right there where Dan was so I just wanted you guys to see for yourself the written in here in the Encyclopedia Judaica the Danites were mixing with other nations they were not part of the uh, Israel tribal confederacy for a while. Literally, like they were outsiders. They had become outsiders. And very importantly, they were seafarers, a seafaring nation, part of the ancient sea people that we read about all the time. All right, so we got a brief hit. So as you see, you've seen where uh, the Danites carried that symbol of... Um, the serpent on them and that was important was that they carried that serpent symbol um that serpent symbol is so important so let me go ahead to are we on this one here yeah. uh let's try and give it one more second to go there so we're going to go to Ethiopia, back to Ethiopia, and we're going to go to Melchizedek and tie all of this in and close on out. So just give All right, so we got a brief history of the Danites and overview of their biblical genealogy. And also wanted to mention how they were sea peoples, how they were integrating with other nations, mixing with other nations, and eventually not keeping the laws, you know, idol worshiping. And they became a very important merchant sea peoples. We're going to read this book now. It's called Dan, the Pioneer of Israel. Where is this tribe today? The Pioneer of Israel. Colonel J.C. Goller from 1880. Go to chapter 1. It says here, Dan, the name, history of Dan, gathered from the Bible, intimacy with the Phoenicians, Israelitish and Phoenician enterprise. Prefix, Don, or Dan. The tribe of Dan by its enterprise and vigor 
has made itself one of the most conspicuous branches of Jacob's family. Its ancestor was the son of one of the concubines and was the firstborn of Rachel's household. God had to judge me, said Rachel, and she called his name Dan, which means to judge. So I'm going to go into a component that, as you see, Dan is always continuously placed with the Phoenicians and so forth. So here in Ethiopia's history, we have what is called the Awi. Um, in the Ethiopian history, the Awi had what it was called uh, Wanaba, Wan, Wan, Wena, Wenaba, um, which was considered the serpent or they had the serpent king or the snake king. Um, Izana, under Izana, Aksumite changed and went to what they were considering the Christian empire. Um, some could say it really is the same thing in a sense, but it changed its language. It is believed by some Ethiopians that Ari or Wana be ruled after Aksumawi, who is the great grandson of Noah the son of Ethiopius, according to the book of Oxum. Um, so we have to study that because now, you know, there's in your Bible, there is no book of Oxum that speaks about Ethiopius or Ethiopes. So Ethiopia, who was the seventh in the ancestral line, um, is also believed the 12th direct descendant of um, Adam. So, you know, there's there's a there's a history in Ethiopia that's going to give you certain things that you're not going to get everywhere else. So in one version, Ari, the myth, the stranger comes to the land where Ari reigns. And after seeing a woman cry for a fact um, that she has given her daughter in sacrifice to the serpent, the man offers to kill the serpent. He requests the woman to provide him a spotless, whiteless lamb and a bowl with juice from poisonous euphor um, the euphor the forbia, um, euphorbia tree. He faces the serpent and offers him the lamb and the juice, which Ari accepts now knowing it will be the cause of his death. After Ari is finally defeated, the people offer the man to become their ruler, a position he gladly accepts until he is ready to let his daughter Makeda reign. She becomes the queen of Sheba, and it is the capital city is Aksum. Some versions of the tale state that the man who killed Ari was named Agabos. Um, so let's just, you know, let's just think about that in certain aspects. Oh, I thought it was going to give me a little bit more history with the um, um, Aksum. So let me try it right here. Because Ari goes to the Aksum Empire. And so the Aksumites are considered great seafarers and so forth. Um, so that's really what I wanted to show. Aksum was the hub of marine trading power known as the Aksumite Empire. Later under the reign of Emperor Kalib, Aksum was quasi Ali Byzantine against the Sassian Empire, the Zoratine, that's the Persians and so forth. So let me see if they give you a little bit more in depth. So, maybe so far I can go back with it. Okay. Other attractions in Aksum include the Archaeological Ethnograph Museum, the Azana Stone written in the Sabaean, Sabaean, Gies, Ancient Greek, in a similar manner to the Rosetta Stone. They will never tell you about this too much. King Basin's tomb, a megalith considered to be one of the earliest structures. The so-called Queen of Sheba's bath, actually a reservoir. The 4th century Toskaka Miriam and the 6th century Dunger places. Um, so local legend claims Queen Sheba lived in the town. So there are a lot of things that are hidden in um, Ethiopia. Um, I really wanted to get more in depth. I... I, I I wanted to use more than that Ethiopian Kushai Empire book, but as we showed that the Kushai Ethiopians had a presence in America, um, let me go one more little spot right here, um, because this was the key with the connection in America. We're going to go back to the Star Series. Um, 
so. Although the Greeks and Romans typically scorned Egypt's animal-headed gods as bizarre and primitive, Anubis was mockingly called Barker by the Greeks. Anubis was sometimes associated with Ceres in the heavens and Cerberus and Hades in the underworld. In his dialogues, Plato often has Socrates utter oaths by the dog, Kaimiton Kuna, by the dog of Egypt, and by the dog, the god of the Egyptians, both for emphasis and to appeal to Anubis as an arbiter of truth and the underworld, the lord of the 17th day, sign Olin, and of the 16th division of the Tonala Malt Sholot, okay, Sholot, this is where they get Sholot, all right? is, as we learn from the picture writings, the god who carries the sun through the underworld, the interpreter of the Codex Tejeriano Remensis, Folio 20, says that the sun goes to shine to the dead. The Duat was the region through which the sun god Ra, now listen to this, the sun god Ra traveled from west to east each night, and it was where he battled Apophis who embodied the primordial chaos which the sun had to defeat in order to rise each morning, bring order back to the earth. You hear that? So just like the Shalot had to guide uh, the sun to the underworld and it can, so it can rise the next morning every time, so did uh, the Wad and you see the whole sun symbology of, uh, you know, battling, to, you know, some, something going on here so it can rise the next day. The peculiar disc of dark feathers, which Shalot represented as having on his back on page 76 of the codex nudal we have thus take for a likeness of the night sun the sun of the underworld now he only for movement is used as a hieroglyphic of the sun by olin was primarily meant the movement of the fire drill as the world stands for the constellation mammal what's three fire sticks this elucidates the relation between the sun and movement. So what we see is in America, there is the Anubis. The Anubis is being used as a symbolism in America. The whole language that was used in the in Kemet or in Egypt for the underworld and the rise is being used in America. So we have to recognize that. The tale of Shikult, figures 99 and 101, which I take to be a conventionalized form of the outlines of the constellation dog, which is figure 1 and 2 here in the bottom, was used as a symbolic ornament of Shalot. It's from the foregone easy to understand. But the same emblem is also worn by Tepejo Lotzli, Chantico, and the mummy of the warrior. And is a, a part of the hieroglyphic of Mokteku Soma. Now, the Tepejolotli is a god of the underworld. His name meaning heart, interior of the mountains. And he appears in the form of a tiger, the animal of darkness. Are we talking about now, jaguar? Now, let me take it back just a little if I can, because I want you to look at this symbol just a little bit more. This is really Ursa Minor. I have just become familiar with this is really Ursa Minor symbol too. So what they're doing is putting Perseus, Pleiades, all of these things. So you have Ursa Minor is the symbol for the mouth opening ceremony in Egypt. So this is the mouth opening ceremony symbol. The same symbol. emblem is also worn by Tepejo Lotzli, Chantico, and the mummy of the warrior. And is a part of the hieroglyphic of Mok Montezuma. Soma. And that's now, in Georgia, the too. Lotli is a god of the underworld. His name meaning heart, interior of the mountains. And he appears in the form of a tiger, the animal of darkness. Are we talking about jaguar? Because there is no tigers in America. We're talking about jaguars. Right? The Spanish used to call jaguars tigres or tigers. Chantico, the fire goddess of Xochimilco, signifies as her various names and myths indicate the sun in the underworld. Of her, it is expressly stated that she was transformed into a dog, and one of her names was Quetzalot. Quetzalot. But Xolot is not only the guide or carrier of the sun, but also in his form of Nanau Utsin, the Nautsin, the sun itself. Alright, you hear that? The sun itself, sun worship. 
this identification of Shalot, Nana Utsin, we owe to Professor Seller. The warrior's mummy was... And then in our traditions, that Nana is a very important terminology as well. Nana Baluku, Nana. So Nana, don't slip. Things are one because these tribes in the Aztecs, the Mayans almost claim Quichi, which is Quichi or Kichi, going to the Kish, Quish, Kish, Kish. Um, so it was a Kush. They claim Kush descendancy. So don't slip. They claim descendancy from Kush. It was adorned also with Blue Dog and its relations to the abode of the dead are evident. Moteku Soma's hieroglyphic consists of two parts, the symbols of the first and of the last constellation, this being with the Aztecs the sign Shutekutli, the fire god, whose earthly representative the Mexican king was. Because of the Xolotl's association with the underworld, he was the god Xolot, the twin brother of Quetzalcoatl. While Xolot symbolized the planet Venus, as the evening star, Quetzalcoatl was Venus as the morning star. Together they exemplified the harmony of opposites, which is, is central to Aztec kingdom. Again, Xolotl's association with the underworld. He was the god Xolot. In the pyramid text of Unas, Anubis is associated with the Eye of Horus, who acted as a guide to the dead and helped them find Osiris. All right, so you see a new Anubis guiding people to get to Osiris or the bones or the body of Osiris, just like Shalot guided uh, Quetzalcoatl to the underworld to find the bones of the, the last human, I guess, people before the, the fourth side. So as we see, the story is the same. The story is the same. Now, just to go a little further, because I'm touching this Kushite in America deeply, but I got to come back to Melchizedek. But I got a nice little thing I wanted to play um, just to help some of my people who might be still a little weary of what we saying. And they thinking it might be against biblical things or so forth or what does it mean? You know, so if this is going to play, oh, I didn't mean to do that. And this will be the last little clip I'll show. And then, like I said, I'm going back to the Melchizedek connection, which is made up of 606 feet, 606 feet, 606 feet, 606 feet, 606. It's made up of staves, exactly the same. Now, if that's not interesting enough, look at the angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza. If you take the angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza, the slope is 51.8 degrees. Let's go back to the earthworks. If you measure the line that goes straight through the center of the structure, right here, and then you go true north, it's 51.8 degrees. That angle is exactly the same angle as the pyramids of Giza. It is the same math the same calculations as ancient Egyptians. Let me show you one more connection. Cushites. In 1860, David Wyrick, he's a guy who surveyed the Newark earthworks. He was digging into a mound near those earthworks and he found a wooden coffin made of oak. They Newark, opened up the coffin New Jersey. and found a skeleton of a man holding a little box. It was about 8.10 inches in size. The box had been cemented shut here. This, by the way, is sitting in Ohio. Well, he opened up the box and he found a little man inside, a little black stone. They took it to scholars and they looked at it. The man seems to be carrying something and there's writing here. Arch first, doorway. They recognize. The writing is, they thought in 1860, some sort of Hebrew. Well, finally, about 20 years later, they 
found some rabbis living in the area, and the rabbis looked at that, and they could read it. They said it was an old, old kind of block Hebrew, a block Hebrew, and it was a rendition of the Ten Commandments. Now, this okay, before we go there, case. let me hit this right here so we can get this. All right. Uh, where's my language page? I got one where I had it already out. Is this it? This might be it. Oh, the pitch is not coming up. Come on. Well, you... All right. So what you're seeing here is the Ugaric alphabet was passed on to the Semitic tribes in the Middle East, which included Phoenicians, Hebrews, and later the Arabs, the Arab, the Arabs. So as you're looking at this cuneiform block kind of language here, which is like an ancient block Hebrew, that's what they tried to say in a certain sense. Um, you will see that. But this is part of the Sea Peoples, the Philistine Phoenicians, Canaanites, these Cushites, these Cushites again. So when we are looking at that, that's what we're actually listening to when we hear this block lettering. Block Hebrew. They said they'd never seen anything like it. Mainstream archaeologists at the time called this a hoax. But then in 1900 or just about after 1900, in Israel. They found the same block-style Hebrew writing. Mainstream archaeologists still dismissed the findings. They found it in Israel, and they found it in Ohio. But there was another stone that they found that they couldn't argue. This is the Bat Creek Stone. It was found during the course of an official Smithsonian evacuation. The Smithsonian didn't understand the, uh, uh, the meaning of the writing on the stone. They thought it was Cherokee, since it came from Cherokee country. They didn't realize that it's actually Hebrew. They had published this originally upside down. They threw it in a box at the bottom of the Smithsonian, put it in the basement. Many years later, a scholar took it out of the box, looked at it, and went, oh my gosh, it's upside down. It's Phoenician, ancient Hebrew. What did he say? Phoenician? But Phoenicians are a Cushite Ethiopian Empire. But they placed the language as a Phoenician Hebrew. Let's go a little further. So what's going on here? What is that about? Where is that history? I'll show you in a few minutes, and we're going to have a conversation, and I'm going to show you some more things that the Smithsonian science, government, commerce colluded to erase. What did he Although say? I want to thank the directors of the documentary Lost Civilizations of North America for bringing these stories to my attention. I was blown away. To find more, visit the website lostcivilizationdvd.com. Here's the thing we should be asking ourselves. I don't know the story of these. Do you know? Did you know that? Do you I know do. Ohio and did you know that? Yes, I do. Why not? Were the American Indians wronged? Yes. Yes. And that's what we focus on in America, is we were bad to the American Indians. Forget about it. It's in the past. The question should be the ones that the founders asked. Who are they? What knowledge do they have? Can you imagine the difference we would have now if we would put our differences Who aside are in, they? Past, in the past and concentrate on today? Well, and say let's learn from each other. What do you have? What is that? Let the church say what amen. What is that? When we come back, I'm going to be joined by uh, uh, P Peter Lilback, who is uh, told you before um, is one of my favorite authors. He's going to talk to me a little bit about the founders here, and I'm also going to show you some documents that show how that history has been erased next well it was erased the Smithsonian annual report um 1882 1883 this is john wesley um howell this is an original copy 
Um, John Wesley Howell in 1789. Again, this is uh, this is the I'm sorry, Powell. This is the director um, of. Uh, now let me stress this. They are erasing the Cushite legacy as it remains in this scriptural form as a birthright record. And that's why I stress that the Cushite women have been a key to the birthright record of the governmental power that was in this for even in the stories from Abraham, as I say, Sarah, as you check the history, Sarah means princess, the only princess in the Sumer Chaldean area at that time is Sobek Nefru. So when we're able to trust that history, we're able to go through certain things and understand the Abrahamic lineage. When we come back to it again, it's Moses with Zipporah, the Ethiopian. When we come back to it again, it's Joseph with Asenath. When we come back to it again, it's David with Bathsheba, then Solomon with Sheba. So this constant restoration of the lineage through just by what the Cushite lineage says, the throne, it says Asa has the throne on her head. So the throne belongs to her who carries the mitochondria, the blueprint of God. So this has always been in the tradition, but this is hidden. And Melchizedek represents this Cushite lineage. And we will explain uh, that. The Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian Institute, he said this. Um, Artifacts found prior to Christopher Columbus's arrival would be considered illegitimate by the Smithsonian. Um... Only the savage Indian culture would be observed and this created. So they could not place another government here. They would only observe a savage Indian culture so that they could say that they are the rightful government that rules these lands. So when you talk about, well, I don't need to know about the Kushite. You need to know how the world is being stole from you and how at one time there was a divine government on the planet. Yeah, there were wars amongst the people and division amongst the families. But there was other things that caused that. So just understanding that they made a choice not to document any history for us prior to Christopher Columbus other than a savage Native American concept. That's their thing. So anything that would have dealt with that there was an Ethiopian Kushite government, that there was Mansa Musa's tribe still here, that there were um, Moors still coming here, that there were um, uh, 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 Aksumite tribes that were still here, that even when the... Um, Hyksos invaded, the royal families of Egypt still came here. So we were mining in this area. We were taking back mining products back from here. We took the camel from here. We took the, 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 the leopard and the jaguar from here. Um, so we have to understand that there's a hidden history. And this is where we go into this last stage and we're going to close out and we're going to go back to a few things but I have to pull this up oh excuse me So what I'm going to do is, and we sticking with this Kushite, we just have to follow the birthmarks. Um, 
as we see in the records, we'll be able to follow the birthmarks and see, okay, well, there we go. There we go there. There we go there. Or they go another one on birthmark. And we've been able to trace the Arwe or the Aksumite, the Cushite, the Canaanite, and this Phoenician. And we've seen that there are stories that are not all the way clear. And we're looking at our history in different lights that allow us to see things. So here we go with this Melchizedek um, and the King of Salem. Melchizedek is King of Salem, King of Peace, which we later call Jerusalem, right? So let me pull up one more thing. I hope I don't slow it down too much on y'all as I pull this up. Okay. Because I like to make this clear. All right, baby. All right, let me I'll close you out because you ain't came up good. Figure I had too many tabs open. All right, let me go back here. So Melchizedek met Abraham. And Abraham is before Moses. This is before you get your Ark of the Covenant. You get any Levitical priesthood and so forth. And Melchizedek was king of Salem, king of Jerusalem. And in that time, you have to think the Israelites are not in Jerusalem. So who is Melchizedek king of? So when we look at Jerusalem, there's a group of people in Jerusalem called the Jebusites. Now, that's the Hebrew, Hebrew concept or later on what they put on them. But Jebusite means to trample under your feet. But mm, let's wonder if that's really who the people call itself or whether they call it. So this is very important for scholars defer on whether Zadok. Now, this is why this is important. Scholars are depend debating if Zadok um, who was served as the priest under David and Solomon was an Israelite or a Jebusite. Many people don't understand this, this importance because they don't really understand what was going on in Israel or Jerusalem at that time, however you want to direct it. So, and as I said, you got to remember the story of the priest and I mean of the, the female concept because uh, David um, has to marry into um, the Cushite lineage for right to rule in this area or into the Melchizedek lineage. So at first, uh, uh, what they say, uh, Saul was supposed to provide uh, David. Is it Saul or Samuel? Well, the was supposed to provide David with the daughter Micah, and he did not. And in that, that that failure that was meaning he was not going to get the right to the throne and Saul's son was supposed to become right to throne whose name is Ishbal Ishbal so this ball is a key factor because in the Canaanite re region um, which we call Jerusalem Salem um, Baal was part of a, 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 a pantheon or of a belief system Baal meant Lord. So it wasn't like it was a, a, a something that was different, but Baal meant Lord. So let's let's go a little further. So in this time, Zadok, the question is when David becomes um, comes into position, um, who is the high priest and who was ruling? What was ruling? So, again, I put the fourth, the Cushite woman. So David then, after he's denied Micah, he has to marry into the Cushite lineage to properly claim right to the throne in the area. Um, and that's just a tribal aspect. So David has to marry into the tribal with Bathsheba. This is where Solomon's mother comes in place. This is why Solomon is given position of the throne before the other children. Okay. So now Bathsheba or Bathsheba, Bathsheba, house of Sheba. So we know that that's in the language um, and you have to study it because Bathsheba is a Zadok, a Zadike. OK, so this is important. So now Zadok is wondering if he is a Jebusite or Israelite. 
Zadok's genealogy constitutes a problem which has long puzzled scholars. If Zadok's father, Ahitab, was the brother of Ichabob, this would have incorporated Zadok into the family of Eli. This would make Zadok brother um, 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 Ahimelech and uncle Abithar. Samuel 22.2. The genealogy, however, conflicts with the point of 1 Samuel 2.27-36 through 36 and 1 Kings 2.26-27. through 27. So I would tell you, our story is veiled in his story, which seeks to explain how it came about that Zadok's family superseded the family of Eli in the priestly service. Hmm. So Zadok's family superseded what was going on at that time? What was the what was the mentality of the people in that area? Another tradition traced in details also posts that Ahitab as Zadok's father, but derives both from a line which does not include Eli. In the Chronicles version, Zadok derived from a line descended from Aaron's son Eleazar. First Chronicles twenty four three specifically contrasts his descendant from Eleazar with the descendants of his co priest Abathar from another son Aaron Ipathar. Another issue, one that has direct relation to question X figure, is the reason David appointed two priests and how Zadok attained attained the position of influence in the reign of David. Zadok associated with David begins after David conquers Jerusalem. So like Salem, Jerusalem is where the Canaanites rule. So David was subject uh, when David subjugated the Canaanite population. This we listen who's there. Their population is Canaanite, Cushite. That has not been conquered in the days of Joshua. They haven't been conquered. Why did Joshua not conquer them? What does that mean? And during the period of judges, he put them to forced labor. I mean, and, and, and later on, the writers of Kings declared the remnant of the Canaanite population was still under forced labor in the days of Solomon. Okay. All the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the uh, um, Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, who were not of the people of Israel, their descendants who were left after them in the land whom the people of Israel were unable to destroy utterly. These Solomon made into forced levy of slaves. Okay. The remnant of the Canaanite population did not become Israelite worshiping of worshiping the God of Israel. They kept the religion, maintained the worship of their God when David conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites. Okay, let's go into this question here. According to the book of Genesis, Melchizedek, king of Jerusalem, was also a priest of El, El Elyon, God the Most High, meaning the name Melchizedek is my king is God, Zedek. In the book Hebrews, the name Melchizedek is interpreted to mean king of righteousness. Another king of Jerusalem is called Adonai Zedek. The meaning of the name Adonai Zedek is my Lord is God, Zedek. Thus, the name Zedek or Zadok are associated with the Canaanite god Zedek. When David conquered Jerusalem and made it the capital of the United Monarchy, he named the city after himself the city of David. He became the king of Jerusalem, assumed the duties of the priest of the cult there. This is the meaning of expression in Psalms, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. David and his descendants offered sacrifice in Jerusalem because they were priests. They were priests, not because they were Levites, but because they were priests after tradition established by Melchizedek, king of Jerusalem. Thus, David appointed Abathar to serve as the priest for the Israelite population and Zadok to be the priest for the Canaanite population who lived in Jerusalem. So you never pay this attention in the Bible that David appoints two priests to handle the population. Who is there? Zadok also served. So when we heard about the Danaanites and the Dan, the tribe of Dan being separated and not really with the Israelites, but with everybody else. So he was with, they were with the Canaanites, the Zadok. So Zadok also served in the tabernacle that was at Gibeon. The Gibeonites um, were the Canaanite people who deceived Israel in the days of Joshua. But they say Joshua didn't conquer them. They didn't get run out. So the story is mixed up. 
So and I'm going to explain that before we close out in just a quick brief statement. After Abathar was banished to Anathoth. See, so the so-called Israelite priest gets banned, sent away. So, you know, this is going to mean he's going to go somewhere. He's going to raise up a following so that when they get a chance, we're going to straighten this. Okay. So Zadok became the sole priest for the nation. So now the Canaanite Melchizedek lineage is in rulership. Oh, my God. Zadok is later classified as a Levite since the Levites were people concentrated for religious duty. But remember, now Melchizedek was before Levite. So the temple there was before there was a Levitical temple. There was a Melchizedek temple. There was a Zadok temple. There was a Canaanite temple. There was a Jebusite temple. So the Zadok priests knew how to keep the temple, keep the people. Several scholars have rejected the view that Zadok was a Jebusite on the grounds that David would not appoint a pagan priest to service of Yahweh. See what they say? So this is the argument where, well, Yahweh, we own Yahweh, and he wouldn't do that to defile Yahweh. However, it is possible that eventually Zadok became a Yahweh. So they're saying Zadok became a Yahweh. Now listen to some of the facts. The fact is that in early Israel, many people identify Yahweh with Baal. What? Saul's son was named Ishbal, man of Baal. One of David's son born in Jerusalem was called Beladad or Baal Nose. In addition, the name of one of the soldiers who served in David's army is Belial or Baal is Yahweh. So Yahweh and Baal to the Canaanite had a mixture. So there are some reasons that point that fact that Zadok was a Jebusite. A Melchizedek. So if he's a Melchizedek, what does that mean? So we got this, we got this whole story going on with the Melchizedek, the Canaanites. And so we're looking at this Canaanites and we're looking at this Melchizedek and we're seeing all of this. And we went into this early a little bit. So let's go, let's go back a little bit so we can try to close out and we touched that this ball cycle Canaanite ball storm guard fertility you know and ball is um, the text identified ball is the god Hadad let me go there let me get some stuff going uh, so Hadad goes to the Akkadian so that's showing you the Sumerian the Akkadian connection I ain't trying to go too far that way backwards. I got to go forward. So let me go back to the God uh, because I need. Oh, there. I should have went here. All right. So ball. Um, The ball cycle. Let's go on into ball. So let's get a little understanding of ball. So because I want you to see the headgear on ball. You could act like you don't see it, but I know everyone sees that that is a Egyptian headgear. And that ball has a symbol of the bull, the ram, the thunderbolt. So, you know, Shango. And then you have the ram and you have the bull, certain things that were elements. But let's look at the title, honorific, meaning owner or lord. Um, part of the solar cult, um, the Hebrew Bible even speaks on it, but let's get some things down here in Baal and the Septagon. They call the Phoenician deities, they call them, um, Amorai. Okay, here we go. All right. So as we look again, we see this comedic, I mean, this comedic headgear, um, Baal Hadu, Baal Habal was identified as the star, star, um, storm god. And then we see that it goes to El. The Phoenician ball is generally identified with either El or Dagon. Listen to what they say now. The Phoenician god is either identified with El or Dagon. Remember now we're looking at birthmarks 
and were tracing the birthmark. So we know that the Phoenicians dealt with the seafarers and so forth. So we in this Canaanite area where the 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 tribe of Dan were, but we see that this is the Melchizedek area. So Melchizedek worshipped the god El. And so when he says El sent Melchizedek, or we said earlier, but let's look at El. Because we want to get it because in a lot of our brothers who are Moors, they say El. A lot of our Hebrew brothers, they say El or El. El so they say, okay, well, the Hebrew, how, well, how do you change that? Well, just do you see? that it is part of the Canaanite deity but even Melchizedek said El Elyon El Elyon God of the heavens and the earth you have to study these things now so we get this you in an ancient Canaanite religion now you're dealing with their concept so we're looking at El El but there are other things that go with El because when they talk about El El also deals with um a group of gods and they call them their hold up let me get it where it's at okay so El is a generic word as for any as God Canaanite the Ugarics it goes to Ugaric so we got Phoenician Hebrew and um Aramic um Aramic Akkadian so this is all of the areas the Phoenicians the Hebrew so this is all an Akkadian and then we got to think about Ethiopia as well because the L is the Cushite, so we're there. So we're looking at L, we're thinking about Baal. So then we see down here they put the Egyptian god Ptah is given the title Dugiti, Lord of Goth, in prison from the Telchis, which is has on its opposite face the name Amenhotep II. The title Dugiti is also found in Serbic text 353 points out that Ptah is also often called the Lord or one of the eternity and thinks it may be identification of El with Ptah. Okay, that led to the epiphany Olam or Olam. The eternal being applied to El so early and so consistently. However, the Ugaric text, Ptah is seemingly identified rather with the craftsman god, Kathawakisi. This is another of the Canaanite. But this craftsman, this still go by the say a lot of the comedical saints put together some of us may miss that they might have an encodement more deeper than what we really know so we get here the phoenician amulets of the second things and here we go an eternal bond has been established for us ashura has established it for us and all the divine beings in the majority of the groups of all the holy ones through the bond of heaven and earth forever the eternal one, Olam, has made a covenant and an oath with us. Asherah has made a pact with us. And all the sons of El, the great council of all the holy ones with the oath of heaven and the ancient earth. So we have, you know, this, 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 is, this is something serious here because El, the holy ones, Asherah, Asherah. Well, that's how we started with Quetesh. Gwadesh, Ashira, the female goddess. And then we have the Ugaric in the Levant. We have the Canaanite. So here we go. El or El, the supreme god, father of all mankind, has fathered many gods, most importantly, Baal, Yam, Ma'at, Zeus, Sidon, Hades, the clay tablets, the Ugarits. El, the goddess of Shira. El is called again. Bull, bull god. He is 
Batanu Benwati, the creator of creatures. So we start to find all of this language. It goes all the way where do we go? El Olam, God eternal in Genesis. It's the language. So now that means Genesis is speaking in a Canaanite kind of tongue. But we started off see that El also goes to Dagon. And so in our closing, we're going to touch Dagon and we're going to be able to show how this even went. We touched to the Americas as we close out. Let's go to this Dagon. Let's see how this takes us to the next stage because this is going to be the interesting one. All right, Dagon. Dagon for the Hebrew, a Dagon in the Sumerian, the Phoenician was God of worship in ancient Syria, across the middle of the Euphrates, across the middle of the Euphrates, with primary temp primary temples located in Tulta Tarka, and though many attestations to his occult. So let's 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 get a little understanding of Dagon. What is Dagon? The Philistines, the Phoenicians. According to the Philo of Biblos, the Phoenicians authors, uh, Sanchez explains Dagon was a word for the grain, the historians, the weather god. But as we get a little further, we see it comes back to the children of Hadad. That was with Baal. Um, but I'm trying to get to the seafaring. Let me get here where you can see this. So in Mesopotamia, Dagon was equated with Enlil. So, okay, y'all who got understanding when we talk about Enlil and Enkidu, we're talking about the Anuki. Those who came to earth. Anuki, those who came to earth. Some of you like to say, well, the Anuki is the gods who come to earth. Well, in Canaanite, they called them the Elohims. But in the Bible, you say Elohim. In Hebrew, you say Elohim. But you're speaking of Canaanite gods. But Dagon is known as the fish. The fish. He gives the fish body. He's affiliated. But here they put him with Enki. You see, he gets the great. But you're going to catch on in a minute. Let me get to where. I thought I would have got a picture in this one here. Uh. Let me get to with Dogon's mythology is equated. Equates him with Enliel. I knew so this is um Ball is a percentage. Uh Iron Age Phoenicians, Lord of the Kings, Plains, Jewish, Dogon, three times ahead of the Philistines, the Canaanite God. All right, here we go. Well, I'm just moving slow. I'm sorry, y'all. So at the bottom, you see that Dagon is the Dagon or Dagon is given where they give him the body of the fish, the fisherman, the seafarer, the fisherman. So we are still speaking about that Cushite Ethiopian lineage, this Phoenician, this Canaanite. So this becomes Dag, the fish, the maritime Canaanite. Let me give you a little insight right here so you can see where I'm at. So I'm right here. So the study of Dagon, though initially none of this suggests that the while Dagon was not an origin of fish god associated with Dag, the fish among the maritime Canaanite Phoenicians would have affected the god's iconog iconograph. However, later he correctly identified it as a medieval invention. Modern researchers not only do not accept it, but even question if Dagon or Dagon was worshipped in the coastal areas. No. It is worship in the coastal areas and it does have its ties with the basic wording that goes to where we spoke about earlier. The Dogon. See, you have Dagon or Dogon. So what does the Dogon say? The Dogon speak about Nomo and the Nomo. So if you know about the Dogon, the Dogon speak about Nomo. What did the Dobo speak? Because now we just spoke about that Dagon and El, they also go to Enliel and Enki, or which would be the Anu Aki, right? But we know that the uh, uh, the Sumerians and that in the um, 
in the upper Mesopotamia area, they spoke about the 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 fish, the do the, the the Dagon or the Dogon. So when the Dogon speak about the fish people or the Nomo that come, but they actually come from the star system, they also spoke about how they come from the star system, Cyrus, A B Osiris. So here we're back with the Orion and the star system Cyrus, the star in the west. So we got the three kings, the three kings, the three magis, and then we have the star in the east, I'm sorry. So the three three magis and the star in the east, or the three kings. And so we're dealing with that Cyrus A prophecy coming out of the Dogon. But this Cyrus prophecy coming out of the Dogon, the Nomo, were known as like the fish people or the, mm. the fish. They were given the symbolism as the fish man or the fish woman which was a, a, a science and it, it has its meaning. See here were um, amphibious beings resembling mermen or, mermi or mermaids. They also appear in the Babylonian, Akkadian and the Sumerian myths. The Egyptian goddess Isis, who's sometimes depicted as a mermaid, many of you did not know that, is also linked with the star Sirius. So we're talking about star Sirius science.